All right. Well, today we're going to talk about a topic that we're calling leveling out or adding on. And, and obviously, as you watch that, that man leveled off in high school, right? You guys ever met someone that's leveled off? I mean, he, he progressed to a point in life, and then he peaked, and he never added anything else onto his life. And it's pathetic to watch him try to draw pleasure from the past at the expense of the future, right? That's what's happening. And, and the good news I have for all of us today is that we're probably better off than Uncle Rico, right? We're probably not to that degree. But the bad news is that we still do have a tendency to level off in life right? We just do. We, we have a tendency to grow and to develop personally to a certain point and then kind of throttle off, right? And let me give you some examples. Like we do this in fashion and, and, and clothing style, right? So I actually heard the story the other day of, of someone here. They, they, were, they went on vacation with a family member and they looked at their brother who's like a 30-something, 40-year-old man and he was wearing a brand new pair of Jinko jeans, right? The super wide leg jeans circa 1996 or something like that, right? And he was excited to be rocking the Jinkos, right? And, 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 and he kind of hit his prime in that area era, and he locked it in, man. And for some of you guys, like I've seen it, you locked it in in the carpenter jean era, and you got to search through stores to find stores that still sell the carpenter jean. And for some of us, it was boot cut, man. You hit your prime in the early 90s, and, and, and you've still got that one store that sells boot cut jeans. And they they don't make these cords in boot cut anymore. And, and then, you know, and so that's, that, that's where we're at, you know, and, and maybe it was the, the high-waisted Z Cavaricis, you know, and you still got those in your closet and you're just waiting for the day that that comes back, right? And it's not just clothing, it's music style, right? And so many of us, we, we, we kind of progressed as music progressed and you knew who the new people were, right? And then something happened, right? And, and you kind of picked your era. And that's why whole radio stations exist that only play music from the 60s or from the 70s or from the 80s or from the 90s, right? Because that was where we leveled off. We said, that's it. It doesn't get any better than Pearl Jam, right? And so, you know, Jeremy spoke in class today. And so we're, why we just kind of level off right? And, and, and the funny thing is, I tried to think of an example of some modern musicians that, like, and I couldn't think of any. I could only think of Pearl Jam. And so, so anyway, like we, we just kind of chill. And the funny thing is, in all honesty, there's really no harm in most of that. In fact, I sometimes wonder about people who stay too current and get too far removed from their generation, right? I mean, when you see the guy that's like 70 with skinny jeans and AirPods in his ears and he's listening to Macklemore or something like that, you think, you might be trying too hard, man. You might be, you can relax a little bit. And so, you know, like uh, my wife, will, I'll try to get too trendy. I'll put on skinny jeans. Actually, all jeans are skinny on me. But anyway, I mean, I'll try to do that. She's like, mm, let's back it up a generation. And so, but... So, so it's okay in some areas to really kind of pick your lane and stay in it. But what about like spirituality and, and emotionally and mentally? Is there a negative impact when we level off in those areas? When we stop learning, stop growing, and we say, I know all I need to know, and now I can evaluate life based on all of this criteria and framework that I already have. What's to be gained then by adding on? Why is it so important that we keep growing internally? And so what we're going to do is we're going to actually continue with Peter's story. If you weren't with us last week, that's fine. We started talking about Peter. We're going to keep talking about Peter because I had Peter on my mind and it was a good example. And so Peter was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. He was a leader in the Jesus movement. And Peter, all things considered was a pretty great dude, right? He was a natural born leader. He was courageous and he was action oriented. And here's what I mean. Some people talk a really good game, right? And, and, but, but they don't tend to do more than talk. You ever seen that? Um, but then some people 
just do. You know, you say, hey, this needs to happen, and you see them out there, and it's happening, right? And that was Peter. He often went in the wrong direction. He often cut off ears. He did all kinds of stuff like that, but he was going to act. He was going to do something. But for all of Peter's strengths, there were still shortcomings, right? There was all kinds of flaws and broken areas in Peter's life. But through his following of Jesus, Peter was growing. He was moving forward. He was adding on. So Peter was slowly morphing from a loud mouth, opinionated, self-centered person into something more beautiful and more effective in the world. And so last week, we talked a lot about Peter's greatest moment of regret. And if you weren't with us, it was that moment when Jesus was going to the cross. He was getting ready to be crucified. And some people asked Peter, you're one of his followers, right? And three times in earshot and in eyeshot of Jesus, Peter disowned Jesus publicly, right? And then Jesus was taken and killed. It was Peter's lowest moment in life. But then in an act of great mercy, after the resurrection, Jesus goes 80 miles away to where Peter had run away to, and he welcomes him back into the following, into the fold. And, and so, so through this event, Peter is welcomed back, and he actually undergoes a lot of growth as he comes back from this low moment. How many of you guys ever had a low moment that you came back from, and that low moment actually produced a lot of growth. And that's what happened in Peter, right? And so after he's restored by Jesus, Peter goes right back into the 12, right back into the same leadership position that he had before leading these Jesus followers. And so you can see the growth and the development that's happened now when about 40 days later, Jesus, after the resurrection, Jesus spends about 40 days teaching his disciples and, and, and being seen by people in the world. And then he, he actually ascends into heaven. And so the, the disciples are in Jerusalem. Jesus told them to go there and to wait, and they're praying. And what happens is there's this giant feast where Jews from all over the known world who had moved out come back to Jerusalem for this big feast, this big celebration. And so the disciples are outside, and, and, and this, this huge crowd of literally tens of thousands of people has descended on Jerusalem. And these people see the Jesus followers, and they begin to mock them publicly. And so here's a moment. Peter was just faced with a moment of public opposition like this, like 40 days earlier, and he crumbled. He denied Jesus. He ran and he hid. But in this moment, as this large crowd mocks, Peter thinks, you know what? At least I've got their attention. Like, if they're making fun of me, they're paying attention. And so he stands up on a box or climbs on somebody's shoulders or whatever he has to do to get high enough for the crowd to hear him. And he begins to address the crowd. He didn't run from the crowd. He didn't go and hide by a fire and try to watch from a distance like he did before. He didn't cut off anybody's ear with a sword. He didn't do any of that. He faces the situation head on, gets up over the crowd, and he says, listen, yeah, I know you're mocking us, but this Jesus whom you killed is both king and God, and you were wrong. And his raising from the dead proves to you who he is and the mistake that you've made. And then Peter publicly calls on this crowd of thousands of people who were hostile just a moment ago. He calls on them to repent, which means to turn around. He says, you need to repent and surrender your life to Jesus, and he'll grant you salvation and new life. And you know what happened? Three, back then they were kind of like, uh, you know, they weren't as nice as we are today. They weren't as developed. They only counted men. And so it says that 3,000 men entered the church that day. So if you start talking about, I mean, if their wives counted, then, you know, you would, it would be more people. And if their children, of course, they counted, right? And so, so thousands upon thousands of people entered the church in one day. 
right? And so, so instead of all this fear, instead of running away, instead of what, the ways he failed before, this moment demonstrates just how much Peter has grown since his last big blunder. And now with the addition of these thousands of people, like women included, and all of these people are now in Jerusalem, and the church in Jerusalem has gone from being these 12 leaders and some ragtag followers with them to now literally thousands of people. And, and, and so they're in Jerusalem, and now the church is just growing like wildfire. People or Jews from all walks of life are entering this Jesus movement, this church, and they're learning that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecies and all of that. And so they're all following Jesus. And, and actually, if you read other places, it talks about the fact that within a few, few years, most of all of the Jewish priests had actually joined the Jesus movement. But there's a problem still at this point because Jesus actually told Peter and the others before he left the world, he said, listen, you're now my witnesses and you're going to go to Jerusalem and then to all of Judea. Like, don't just stay in this city, go to the whole state. And then you're going to also go to Samaria, which were basically people that they really didn't like. And it was just a, a very, uh, uh, I wouldn't say mild form of racism. It was just a blatant, blatant form of racism. And then he said, and not just Samaria, but to the ends of the earth. You're going to go everywhere. All these people groups that you have not included up until now, that you have not liked, you're going to go to them as well. So as the church is multiplying and growing in Jerusalem, they're doing none of that. They're saying, ah, it's pretty nice here, right? And so they're not, they're not. And then eventually God has to just keep knocking on Peter. And so God gives Peter this crazy weird vision slash dream thing. And he speaks to him through this weird occurrence. And he actually instructs him specifically and says, listen, there is a, a foreigner living close by that I want you to go to his house because he's actually seeking God. I want you to go there, tell him about this Jesus thing. And then him and his whole house, they're going to believe. And I want you to baptize him. And when it says his whole household, that means all of his family, everyone that worked for him. And so it was a good number of people. And Peter goes, ah, I don't know if that's a good idea. Oh, okay. And so, so he says, no, I, I, God, here's the thing. I've never defiled myself by going into a non-Jewish home. So here's the problem. Here's why, why, why Peter and the others didn't follow Jesus' instruction to go out. They were racist. Right? They, they, and they dressed it up in religion, right? They gave religious excuses for it. But he said, like, I've never been in the house of a person who's not culturally just like me. And, and the thing is, it's never blatant. He didn't understand those people. He didn't know how to communicate with those people. He thought he mistrusted those people. And then in return, those people mistrusted him and on and on. And that's really how that cycle works. And so he wasn't willing. And so God is arguing with Peter in this miraculous vision moment saying, no, you can't call them unclean. I'm sending you there. You go. And then at the next moment, God goes, oh yeah, by the way, the people are here to pick you up to go there. There's a knock at the door and it's too guys, and they say, hey, we've been sent here to get you to come tell our master about Jesus, right? And that, if that's not convincing enough. And so Peter goes with them. They have the event. He tells everybody in the house about Jesus. Everybody accepts. They surrender their lives to Jesus, and they're baptized, and they're, they're believers in Jesus, and, and God powerfully works in their lives. And this is a big breakthrough moment for Peter because he realizes, guess what? God doesn't just love people who are just like me. Guess what? People who are nothing like me are just as important to Jesus. And so it's this breakthrough moment. And so he knows it's okay for non-Jewish people to follow Jesus, but I'm still not going to be a part of that. <laughs> like someone else can take care of that. I'll focus here in Jerusalem with all the Jewish people that I understand. And so for a long time, he still just stays there in Jerusalem. And he's okay with the idea theoretically but in practice, it's just tough for him. It's a breakthrough moment that he sees it's possible, but he just doesn't know how to move himself to get past all of his own hangups. And then eventually there's this change. This guy becomes a Jesus follower. His name was Saul. They change it to Paul. And Paul gets very excited about Jesus. And Paul, through the course of events, gets this understanding that God has somehow called him to take the gospel outside the Jewish nation. 
And so Paul starts on these journeys, and he spends the whole second half of his life just traveling from city to city and country to country around all of Asia Minor. And he goes to a city, and sometimes he spends a few months, sometimes he spends a few years, and he meets people, he tells them about Jesus, they become followers of Jesus, he baptizes them, and and slowly but surely churches form in all of these cities. And so so they think that the Apostle Paul could have started as many as 27 churches around Asia Minor during these years of his life. And so as all of this is happening, Peter is still back in Jerusalem, but he knows what's going on in these other cities. And one city in particular, there's a large non-Jewish church, and it's called Athens. And so Peter gets curious enough. He probably remembers what God had done in that house that day with that non-Jewish family and their friends, and God's probably dealing with them. So he actually goes to Athens to check it out. And he hangs out there, and you know what he finds out? These people are pretty cool. I think they're probably a lot like me. And it turns out that Jesus has done the same thing in their life as he has in my life, even without all the Jewish background and heritage and religious practice. And so over time, he begins to build relationships. He begins to overcome this inner prejudice, this mistrust that he has. And there's this, it actually talks about this. There comes a moment where he starts eating meals with even non-Jewish people. So remember a few years ago, he wouldn't even enter the home of someone who wasn't just like him. And now for the Jews to eat with somebody was one of the most sacred things that like aside from marriage and that bond, eating a meal with someone was, was a big statement about your connection to them. And so here we have Peter who's spending a lot of time in Athens and he's even eating meals with these Athenian Christians. And then something happens. There's some confusion about how much should these Gentiles have to do in order to follow Jesus, right? Because the Jews had all of these Old Testament laws that many of them still followed. And a lot of the Jews wanted the, the new Christians to, who were coming in from pagan cultures to have to become Jewish as well as following Jesus and do all of the laws and grow their beards and only eat certain foods and, all, you know, and, and circumcision and all of that fun stuff. That There was all these things that were supposed to happen, they thought. And so there was this debate. So Paul's hanging out here with these Christians who've been following Jesus now for years in Athens who have done none of that stuff. And Peter is, I mean, and so he's eating with these people. And then the the church in Jerusalem, the, the very Jewish Christian church, sends representatives to Athens. They show up there and, and they're hanging out for a while. And so it's mealtime and something happens. Peter seizes Jewish friends from Jerusalem, the ones that have the problem still the way that he used to with non-Jewish people, and he refuses to eat now with his Gentile brothers. And so this guy, Paul, who's there in the moment, doesn't wait, doesn't have a private conference. He goes, hey, (laughs) Peter, that's a sin, just so you know, right? Imagine it, we're in here, and Doug just goes, hey, Bob, what you're doing right now, that's a sin, Right? And all you guys are like, oh, no, he didn't. You know, and so, and that's what happened, right? You know, Paul goes, Peter, in case you're wondering how you used to always eat with all of these guys, and then these other guys showed up, and now you won't eat with these guys, I just want you to know that you're being a hypocrite, and that's a sin. Whoa. <laughs> So this is a pretty explosive moment. It's kind of like Peter is like the guy who used to have all the really popular friends. And then like those high school movies, he meets a not popular person and finds out he's a real person too and gets to be friends with him. But then the popular friends show up and he's like, oh, what are you doing here? And he just kind of pretends that, that he is not friends with them. That's what Peter did in this moment. And he gets busted in front of everybody. And so the question is, here's the thing. Peter has grown a lot up until this moment. But this is kind of a defining moment. How he responds to this question, this call out, this, oh no, you didn't, you know, how he responds to that, it's going to determine whether he levels off and stays where he is or whether he keeps adding on to his life. And so we'll finish that story kind of as we finish up. But I want to give you, we're going to read a scripture. We're going to talk about some stuff. But so here's the thing. Years after this event happened, Peter wrote a letter, and he had it circulated through all the known churches in all of the, you know, Asia Minor in the world 
by their, their, their mentality at that point. And so here's what happened. Right away as this letter started circulating, people recognized this is more than just a letter from Peter. Like, yes, Peter wrote it, but we really believe God is speaking through Peter in this letter. And so this letter was not just read and discarded. It was held onto and copied and sent to churches, and they didn't just read it once. It turned out they would read it, and then they would talk about it publicly in the church time after time after time, which is kind of what we're doing today, okay? And so what happened is then, over the course of time, people agreed that there were certain ones of these letters from the apostles that were inspired by God, and they put them all together in a book, and that's called the B-I-B-L-E, Bible, okay? And so that's how it happened. That's how that happened. And so we, we still have this letter today that was sent to all the churches, and still today we're reading this letter publicly and then talking about it the way that they did then. And so here's Second Peter, uh, which, can you guess which letter it was that he wrote? That's the second one, that's right. And so uh, Second Peter chapter 1, we're going to read verses 3 through 8. It says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a, for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us through His own glory and goodness. So I want you to see that everything you need for a godly life is still to be given, has already been given. Everything you need for a godly life has already been given. Verse 4, through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature. So through what he's revealed of Jesus, you have the opportunity as a person to participate in the divine nature. That's a Anyway, uh, to participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in this world that's caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to your goodness knowledge and to your knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection Love. Now listen to this part. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you guys have ever, even for a season in your life, felt useless as a Christian? Man, I have right? I feel like there's times where I feel like, man, this doesn't make any difference. What It doesn't make any difference that I'm a part of this church. It doesn't make any difference. I have nothing to contribute. I have nothing to add. When people need, need something, I'm never the one that can help them, right? That's what it means to feel useless, to feel helpless, to feel like, yeah, I'm sure you got problems, but I've got no answers. And he's saying, if you do this stuff, you'll never be ineffective. You'll never be unproductive, as a Jesus follower. So here's our first point we're going to make from this scripture and this story is that the finished work of Jesus is the standard issue tool chest given to every Christian. You see, I love how it says it. Everything needed for a godly life has been given through our knowledge of Jesus. It's already been poured out. It's already been distributed. The question is, will you avail yourself to it? You see, my son Luke is playing basketball now for the first time ever, and so I'm a really proud parent. Um, he's never played in his life. He's 10 years old. Um, you know, we didn't do that early training program like Tiger Woods, you know, out there in a diaper and putting. And so anyway, so we, we didn't do that. So he's 10. He's interested in basketball finally. And, and how many of you guys know when you start a sport at 10, you're not great? right? And so he, he started off and he wasn't great, but man, he's been working so hard out there in the driveway, shooting baskets, you know, playing against me, doing all this stuff. And, 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 it's, and he's growing and developing. And the other day, just last week in his game, he scored his first basket. It was so exciting. It was like, yeah, Luke, you know? And so he's, he was so pumped, right? And, and, and he, he's really thrown himself into this thing because we're, we're so proud of the fact that he's really wanting something and he's, he's working hard and he's proud 
practicing and he's, he's getting better, but as good as that one basket is, there is this one kid on his team who is so much better than all the other kids. You guys have seen that kid, right? Um, Every team has that kid. And you think, like, first you want to check his driver's license. Like, how'd you get here today? But this kid is so good, man. He's, He's strong. He's fast. He knows the plays. He just, he has a confidence about him. You know, he's, he's handling the ball. He's running down the court going three, three, you know, like calling out plays to all the other players. Man, he can dribble. He can go between his legs. He can do the fadeaway jump shot. I mean, he's got it all. Oh, you're looking at this kid and you go, how is he so good, right? He can play defense. And if this kid gets an open shot, He's almost guaranteed to make it. And I'm thinking, how is he 10, right? And so, so I mean, it's an amazing thing. And all these other parents are talking about after the game, how is Billy so good? And one of the parents knows Billy and Billy's parents. And they say, you know, Billy actually wakes up an hour earlier than everyone in his house every day. And he goes out to the driveway and he shoots and he practices for an hour before anyone else is even awake. And then after that hour, he comes inside, showers, and gets ready for the day with the rest of his family, right? Because here's the thing. There is, we so often see people that advance in whatever area of life, and we think, oh, man, it must be great to be so good at things. It must be great to have so much money. It must be great to be so good-looking, so athletic, whatever that thing is, right? And we see all of that. You guys think that every week, right? And so we, we see all of that. And we think that it's just this thing that was bestowed on people. But Billy was given the same basketball that every other kid was given. Billy's hoop is the same diameter that every other hoop is, right? The only difference between Billy and all the other kids is how much Billy works at it. And so that's what makes Billy so good. You see, a basketball is standard issue. But it's what's done with that basketball that decides so much. And what I want to say is that that what Jesus contributes to our spirituality has been universally given. The question is, will we avail ourselves to it? It's sitting there, right? The, The scripture says it's made available through your knowledge of him. So the more you know him, the more like him you're going to be able to be. And so it's all about how much you're going to apply that to this. And the thing is, this may be like, oh, that's a bummer. I thought it was just going to happen. I thought you were, we were going to all come up to the front and you were just going to put your hand on me and that was going to be it. I was going to be spiritual, right? But the, that, it's not bad news. It's good news because what that means is that there are no one percenters who are capable of things that none of the rest of us are. Because the world is that way in a lot of ways, right? There are people who just have resources and people who don't. And there's just all these things that do exist. There are imbalances that exist. But in this thing, all that's given to any one person is given to all of us. And the only question is, will I avail myself to it? Right? There is no one who simply does not have the means for a godly life. Because the scripture says, all that you need for a godly life has been given in Jesus. So the next point I want to make is that this Jesus life is by nature a life of adding to. Right? The Jesus life is not a one and done thing. And some of you guys have no idea what one and done means. Here's what one and done means. Here's an example of one and done. A driver's license is an example of one and done. Okay, so when you get your driver's license, you read that book and you read that book and you still fail the test. And then you read that book and you read that book and then you fail the test. And then they only let you take it three times. And so then you really read the book and then you pass the test, right? And then eight seconds after the test is over, you forget it all, right? And so how many of you guys, I won't ask you about you, but how many of you guys know that your spouse would not be able to still pass the test today if they took it, right? (laughs) So uh, next week we are starting the marriage uh, series. And so, um, <laughs> um, that's how it started for Glenn. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and so that's, um, <laughs> 
No, like, I, I, honestly, like, if I ask some of you, like, right off the spot, like, okay, you're parked downhill, no curb, which way do you turn your wheels? You're parked uphill with a curb, which way do you turn your wheels? Right? If I ask you, how, you know, how long do you lose your license for your third DWI? Some of you might know from experience. The rest of you won't. <laughs> Remember, right? And so there's all of these things that we know that we had to know for that test, right? How many of you guys, be honest, could still flawlessly parallel park? How many of you guys would have to buy a new set of tires after you were done, right? I mean, it's just, right, you, you had all of these abilities and then you passed the test and now all you need is a basic ability to operate a vehicle and use a cell phone at the same time and you're good, <laughs> right? You don't, no, don't use yourself. And so um, that's, that's it. Right now, as long as you can turn that key, you know, one pedal means go, one pedal means stop, you're pretty much in line with the rest of us, right? And that's how it works. That's an example of one and done. And the truth is, so many of us think that's what it is to, to accept Jesus. Yeah, man, when I was 10, I prayed a prayer, checked that box. Man, they even dunked me underwater, so I'm good on that now. I've already checked that off, dude. I don't know why we're even talking about this anymore. But life in Jesus was designed to be a journey, not an accomplishment that gets checked off a list. And Peter actually thought that this point was so important that he said, make every effort to continue to add to your faith. Make every effort to add to your faith. I love how I was reading this in other translations. Um, and so another translation says the same thing, but it just says it differently. It says it like this. Bend all your energy to the task of equipping your faith. I love that. Bend all your energy to the task of equipping your faith with goodness, with knowledge, with self-control, with perseverance, with godliness, with mutual affection, and with love. So, so bend your energy, bend all your energy to equipping your faith in Jesus with those things. Add those things to the simple saving faith in Jesus. And so here's what that means. I'm gonna kind of, we're just going to kind of fly through this. The list is a lot simpler than it looks on the surface, okay? And so, so this whole thing, the starting point is faith right? That's how we enter this Jesus life. We don't have to do anything. We put our trust in Jesus that his sacrifice paid for our sins, that his righteousness applies to my life, and now God can deal with me. And that's how we enter the Jesus life. At that moment, we're right with God. Our sins are forgiven, right? But it's very simple. It's still just faith at that point. We believe, and God has received us, and, and that's where the journey starts. But here's the problem. A lot of people act like that's where the journey ends. It's not a finishing line, it's a starting point, according to this scripture. That's where we start, right? And so it's kind of like building a custom home. Has anybody ever had their own house built before, right? Uh, you build, you, you give them the instructions, they build it, right? Everybody's like embarrassed. No, I'm not that rich, right? It's okay to have a house built. And so you have a house built. But how many of you guys have looked at neighborhoods where they build all the houses? On the outside, they all look the same, right? And so there is a basic house that you're not going to change much about. It's going to look like this on the outside. And what makes it yours is what you add on the inside, right? And so you got to make some decisions, right? Yes, I'll have windows. Like how many of you guys were built and you were, you were surprised that that was an option? Oh, windows are an option. Okay, I'll add that. Thank you. So then you got to decide, do you want the, the cheap windows that fall out the first time you open them or do you want the $12,000 windows? Oh, I want the $12,000 windows, right? And then you got to, well, how about the floor? Do you want us to leave it the basic uh, particle board or do you want us to add some flooring? Okay, that's extra good. So you choose your flooring and you, you pay extra for the flooring and, and then you got to decide side about your kitchen, right? Do you just want the pipe to run out of the wall with a trough under it? Or do you want cabinets? Yes, I want cabinets, right? Do you want the, the regular plain Jane uh, countertops? Or do you want where we go to Italy and we tear down a chapel and we bring that marble over? <laughs> yeah, I want that, right? And so you got, I mean, I do you got to decide all of that stuff. Then you got to decide, do you want your basement finished? Or do you want to get bit by spiders every day, right? And so you decide that. And then there's my favorite one. Do you want a door? coming out of your kitchen that walks out into nothing so that people break their legs when they walk out it, 
right? How many of you guys have ever seen those doors? I love those doors. You see them, they're like 20 feet up and there's just nothing there, right? Oh, you want us to build a deck under it? That's going to be another 20 grand, right? And so that's how it works though, right? And at the end of the day, what you have is different than the guy next door who didn't put the deck and, and now he's, you know, not able to run anymore. And so that's how it works. And so that's, that's what you do. You build the house. Now, what makes that, what takes that from just a house to your home is all of those things that are what? They're additions. They're the things you add on. Now, there's a big difference. This illustration kind of falls apart in one way. The big difference is in that house, every step you add costs you more money, and it just means it's that much longer that you have to sign your life away, right? But in, in following Jesus, right, Christ, the, the scripture says, has already paid it all. All of that's already been paid. Our choice is whether or not we install it. Right? And so all these things for a godly life, all these add-ons that are going to make you really good at living are there. They're already available. They're, they're laid out for us in Jesus. We just have to decide, am I going to install this in my life or am I not? So faith in Jesus is the basic house, right? And then from there, it says to add goodness, right? And so, so the first step is I have faith in Jesus. Now my intention is to be good, Right? To be good, right? Here's the problem with that. What does it mean to be good? Right? And so, so then the scripture goes further. So first, there's just got to be an intention. How many of you guys, you know, I was like, I accepted Jesus, but I still didn't intend to be good, right? I just didn't want to go to hell. And so now, but then there comes a point where you grow the next step. It's not just a fire avoidance policy. Now it's you genuinely want to be good, right? And so you go, okay, well, what does goodness mean? It says to add to your goodness knowledge. So what is it? What do we need to know? We need to know Jesus. All of this has been made available to us, the scripture said, in our knowledge of him, right? And so how do you get to know Jesus? You read the Bible. That's why we have the three P's. One of the P's is pursue. You pursue Jesus in the Bible, unless you figure out a better way. I don't know what that is. I haven't seen him anywhere lately other than the pages of scripture, okay? Um, I saw that one thing on the internet where someone saw his face and their toast. Um, I want to buy that toaster. But other than that, unless you have that toaster, you're only going to see Jesus in the scriptures, and so as you read them, you're going to know Jesus more. And so you're going to add to your faith knowledge. And then as you add to your faith knowledge, you're going to know Jesus. What you're going to see is there's parts of me that don't look like him. And so then he says, self-control, add to your knowledge, self-control. So what you're doing is you're going, here's Jesus, here's me. I need to control myself and fit it into the mold that I see in Jesus. And so that's your first step towards growth. But then he says, add to that perseverance. You know why? How many of you guys have ever changed a habit to look more like Jesus? And it's super exciting for like a week, right? And then like your husband says something stupid and you're like, I need to set this Jesus thing aside so I can fix this, right? And so, I mean, there's, there's all of these things like that, you know? And so, so you make these changes, but before long, the changes grow tiring, right? And you go, I don't feel like doing this anymore. And what's really happening is your sinful flesh is pushing back. It's trying to rebound and regain control. And that's why it says you need perseverance. Because if you persevere through that, what happens over time is you're made new on the inside. And then you achieve what it calls godliness. And once you're at the point of godliness, then the nice things, the good things you do are actually coming from what's inside and they're not you holding back what's inside and substituting. So there is a period of time where it's self-control and perseverance where this isn't my nature. This isn't how I normally would respond, but because I know this is how Jesus responds, this is how I'm going to make myself respond. But I promise you do it long enough, eventually this becomes your nature. You become God. Godly. And then when that good stuff comes out, it's actually life-giving. It's not taxing. It's not exhausting. And then you're, that, that's what it is. That's godliness. The good things that come out are actually the overflow of this full and good life that you have inside. And then it says to add to godliness mutual affection. So now that you're growing, what has to happen next is you have to turn your attention to other people. Because as you get better, you know what you're going to notice? Other people are still dumb, right? 
Like, how come they're not figuring it out like me? You know, I mean, I've been pure in this area for three weeks and this guy's still an idiot. What's wrong with him? Right? And so it's commanding us mutual affection because here's the thing. Affection is not a feeling. It's a choice. It's a discipline. And so you may not feel fondly to this person, but you're going to act affectionately. You're going to act kindly. You're going to act in grace and mercy. And you're going to dispense that as a discipline the same way you were disciplining yourself to control yourself, to make yourself look like Jesus. Now you're controlling yourself to love of others like Jesus did. And so you're, you're acting in mutual affection. And here's why it's a command. Because people are dumb. They are. We are all broken people trying hard to live next to other broken people. And so sometimes their brokenness is going to cause issue. And sometimes your brokenness is going to cause issue. But most of the time, it's going to be both of you together causing issue. And so in that environment, the only thing that works is if we discipline ourselves to act out in mutual affection rather than what we're feeling, thinking, or wanting to respond with. And here's the cool thing that happens. If you discipline yourself to act in mutual affection, God works in your heart, and what was once a discipline becomes love. How many of you guys have ever not liked somebody but decided to treat them well, and then all of a sudden you discovered that you, your thoughts about how they act haven't changed, but, but you genuinely love them, right? It's happened in my life more times than I can count, right? There, you know, as I, there's been so many times where I've, God has just really kind of highlighted to me, you know, like, hey, you really do hate that person. You know, and I'm like, well, hate's a strong word, God. Are you sure about that? You know, I'm, I'm just guessing. And so, you know, and so I really kind of, and so then I have to work on myself and I have to go, okay, I'm going to start acting with affection. Now you guys are all going to be self-conscious when I'm nice to you. And so, um, am I one of those people? And so anyway, and so I have to discipline myself. And over time, some of those people have become people that I really do genuinely love and the others I just killed. And, and so anyway, um, <laughs> someone really liked it. Um, and so what he's telling us is to bend our energy toward mutual affection Right? And as we do that, the thing is that love grows in well-watered soil. So as you invest deliberate attention and affection towards people, God works in our hearts and then love grows for those people. And so according to Peter, all of those things together equals spiritual growth. It's how you add to your faith. But the big key here is the continuation of this process. That is the most crucial part, right? This process should be running in a loop in our lives all the time. You know, you get to the end of the process, start over. Let me look at Jesus again. Let me figure out an area where we don't match and I'm going to match it up and I'm going to apply self-control and, and perseverance and, and I'm going to become godly and then I'm going to, you know, all that and just keep going round and round through that loop and you will continually grow your whole life. And here's the thing, guys, for an individual and for a church, there will never come a point where we can just rest, where we can go, I got the final key in place. Now we can just ride this train to the end. We've got to continually journey forward. This is a journey where every continued step of obedience is as powerful as the ones before it. I want you to think about that for a second. You see, if, if you're a person who thinks back to the days in your li life that really seemed spiritual, that really seemed good, and they're all kind of back there, or you think back to the days where you thought the church was really good, it's really likely that what's happened is that your journey has stopped. Because the way it's supposed to work is that every continued step is as powerful and transformative as the ones who have come before. God's plan is always for you to move forward, always to be taking more ground in your own life. And so I want to take a quick minute. We're going to review what he said. Next, he says, if you possess these in increasing measure, they're constantly increasing, then you will not be ineffective or unproductive in your knowledge of Jesus. So if you reverse engineer that statement, then if we are not growing, then our faith will not be producing what it was meant to produce. And that's for us and for the world around us. And so the reverse and the way he says it 
is true. If we're growing, then our faith will be effective and productive. And so what does effective and productive mean when, when it talks about Jesus? As Jesus made these two statements, he said that his main purpose and his ministry was, I came to seek and to save the what? The lost. So one of Jesus' main focuses was to find people who weren't connected to him, to God, and to connect them, to seek and to save the lost. And then Jesus also said that our enemy has come to steal, to kill, to destroy, but he has come to give us life and life more abundant. So Jesus' purpose is to find broken and lost people and reconnect them to God. And then once they're connected to God through faith, to restore an abundant life to them that sin and the corruption of this world robs us of. So God's initiative through Jesus is all about bringing life to lost people and greater degrees of wholeness and blessing to those who are found. That's why that's our mission as a church, that we want people to encounter grace right where they are, but then also to be moved by God's grace toward all that God has for their life right? And so if we're growing in our faith, I want to say this, if we're growing in our faith, we'll be better at life and we'll be an instrument in others finding life in Jesus themselves. Those two things will be happening. They will mark your life if you're growing. You will be getting better at life and you will be helping others who find life in Jesus. And those two effects of spiritual growth are inseparable, If you are growing in Jesus legitimately, those two things will be happening. You will be getting better at life personally, and you will be a part of other people finding life. You cannot separate them without distorting what Jesus really came to do. And so we're almost done. I want to say this. Guys, God's plan is as much about you as it is about the world out there, and it's as much about the world out there as it is about you, right? God's plan is as much about you as it is all those people who are out there. And it's as much about all those people out there as it is about you. So we're going to finish by looking back at Peter's story. Paul confronted Peter with his sin, right? And, and, and just as Peter had done in past situations, he grew from it right? He didn't shrink back. He added to his faith knowledge. He recognized his shortcoming. He said, you're right, Paul. This is what Jesus's love looks like. My love looks like this. And so I'm going to push them together and make my love fit Jesus's love. Jesus's love is bigger than differences that divide us. Jesus's love doesn't shrink away when there's opposition. And so I'm going to love like Jesus. And as a result, Peter became more godly. The prejudice that was in his life worked its way further out. He went from blatantly disliking people to kind of liking them to then liking them, but not able to let other people know about it. And now he's going to openly love and participate in life with his new Gentile brothers and sisters. And in doing this, what happens is Peter actually becomes a key person. So he, he, he repents of his sins. And then a little while later, there's actually a big debate in Jerusalem, right? They're trying to decide how much of these Jewish laws these new Christians are going to have to follow. And because of the transformation in Peter, Peter stands up in front of everybody and he goes, this is nonsense. We haven't been able to follow all these laws. Jesus makes us whole. These guys are whole in Jesus already. I've been eating meals with these guys for years and they're every bit as full of Jesus as I am. And they're not following any of these rules. So I don't think we need to make them follow any of these rules and they can just come to Jesus as they are. And that's why you and I today can follow Jesus because we're all mostly probably Gentiles here, right? We're not following Jewish laws. We came to Jesus. We didn't have to grow our beards or get circumcised or do any of that kind of stuff to enter the church, right? And so he opened the door wide for the whole rest of the world to know Jesus. And that transformed Christianity that moment. And it's all because Peter added to his faith. Because he grew personally, the church grew exponentially. You see, when we grow, our lives get better, but God's kingdom also gets bigger, right? That's what happens, And so I want to do, we're going to talk just for a second about those commitment forms because this is part of this, is that here's the cool thing, is that so many of us as a church have been doing this. In the last two years, I've watched people grow who were just, man, they were just attenders. They were just 
like butts in a seat, like, hey, I'm here, and now you're leading ministries, you're, you're, you're doing things, you're discipling people, you're, you're in positions of influence, you're making a difference for Jesus. And what's happened is as we've grown better, the church has grown wider. It's grown bigger. More people have come to faith in Jesus. And you know what's going to happen is as more of us continue to do that, that process will actually intensify. It will speed up, and we'll see more and more people come to know Jesus, and we'll see more and more people grow to points in their lives where they're contributing to the growth uh, and development of others. And so that's what's happening, and that's really why we're doing this, this campaign, is that, is that we're at a spot where we need to make some expansions and some changes just physically in the building so that we can keep up with the growth of our leaders. We've got leaders now that we don't have space for them to work in, right? And what's going to happen is that we've actually got right now five or six people who, who want to go into ministry, and we say, hey, why don't we train you to do ministry here? Why don't we have you working with our own people, you know? And so, so we're going to try to provide space for that. So that's really what this is about. This is about us as a church helping people grow better so that the God's kingdom grows bigger. And so that's, that's what we're doing. That's why we're starting this giving campaign. It's, it's really, it's just all about that, right? And so here's, I want to be clear, like um, we're, we're not asking anybody to divert like their tithes. If you're already tithing and supporting the church, that's incredible. That, 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 that should continue. And so this would actually be something in addition. If you really feel like, hey, God's giving me something that I want to use for that, that's great. So, so we're not just kind of moving money from one column to another, but this is something in addition to what we're doing, and that'll enable us to do this without taking away from other areas. And so what this is, is really like over the next three months, as God enables and provides, I'm committing to, to contribute this much to this, this project. And I'm planning to do it. We just, just to help us plan, if it's going to be a one-time gift, or is this is going to be something that I'm going to have to collect money for, right? Or steal it from somebody, whatever. Um, and so as I do this, it's going to come in over time, right? And so there's some instructions on there, and then just your name. Now, some of you, you've known about this, you've known it was coming. And so you already know, you've talked with your spouse, you've kind of communicated, You've, you've prayed and you kind of feel like you have something you know you want to contribute, you might be ready to fill that out right now. In the, in the, you know, and you can, and what will happen is, is we'll have some ushers who will grab those as you're, as you're leaving today. Um, and so, so that's fine. If you're not ready, that's great. Don't fill it out today. Go home, talk about it. And here's what I want us to do. Like, like if you say, hey, I want to do this, like do one thing, figure out like, hey, what can we do? And then pray like, God, if you provide more, like what, what might be possible? Right, and kind of kind of make a commitment based on on faith. And so that's what we're we're gonna do, but but it really just all comes down to the fact that that we want to help make people grow, make people better, so that we can reach more people for Jesus. And so this is just one way that we do that, but but not the whole thing, and that's not the whole point of what we've talked about today. So so uh, take a minute. I'm gonna pray as we kind of finish service. Um, you can kind of just talk amongst yourselves and do that if you need to. And again, we'll bring it back next week. There's the giving box out in the hallway. You can drop it in there. We'll get it the same way. Um, but but that, that's that. Let's pray. Father, I give you thanks because your plan is so good. Uh, you love mankind, which means that you love us and you want to bring wholeness and transformation to our lives but you also want that as much for everyone that's not in this room right now, for the world around us that is lost, that's hurting, that's broken, that's messed up in addictions or pride or, 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 or spending, just all these other things, all these patterns that can be so destructive. They're trying to find life in things that aren't life-giving. And so, so as much as you want to set us free, now that we know you from all these things that aren't life-giving, you still want to do that for the world that's not in this room yet. And so as we grow, as we become more in you, it's going to pave the way for, for the world to know you more. And so we thank you for that. God, as we start this season as a church, as we kind of set our sights on something that's going to enable us to expand what we can do in this city for you, I pray that you'd give us specific vision, specific leadership, and that you would provide in ways that we maybe not even are thinking of right now. Um, and we give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, God bless you. Have a great day. Um, I don't see any ushers. So there's the box out in the foyer. As you're ready, you can drop it in there or just bring it back next week. Thanks.